Crappy Cable Live. Welcome back, everyone. Now it's time for our special report on secondhand smoke and its exposure and how it affects our children. It's a very important topic. And with me to discuss it is Dr. Katherine Davis and Dr. Martha Tingen. Welcome, ladies. How are you? Doing fantastic. Glad to be here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here. This is such a, an important topic. And uh, what got you motivated to do this study? Well, um, this is Dr. Tingen. I'll just mention real quickly that um, I have um, the literature in the scientific world um, has really come out with a couple of studies that passive smoke exposure may indeed make some things like metabolic syndrome um, worse in children. Oh, wow. And, and which is a pretty significant thing. And we are really learning that often children are developing what we call um, early antecedents of later disease that's not manifest for 10, 20, 30 years down the road. So Dr. Davis, which I'll let her talk about in a minute, had a fantastic um, grant from the National Institutes of Health. And I had some dollars from the Cancer Society here in our regional area. And I said, how about let's look at the children that you have who are all obese or either overweight based on either um, 85th or 95th percentile. And I said, let's look at their blood, if you have permission, which she did, and see if they're exposed or not and if it makes any difference in their fatness and also she is an expert in cognition so we also wanted to see if it had any impact on their thinking we had self-report measures on parents um, as to whether they actually smoked in the home or not and um, so we did not measure anything of the parents blood but we had self-reported if they exposed their kids in the home and so we decided to do the study so that's kind of where i was um, I'm really passionate about primary and secondary prevention and getting children off to a great start in life from birth so that they can be healthy for the rest of their life related to not taking up bad habits like smoking, like eating great nutritious meals that are healthy but that are, you know, don't lead to obesity, lots of physical activity, et cetera, et cetera. So this was just one little, another thing that was very important to me. And Dr. Davis and I are colleagues at the Georgia Prevention Institute at the Medical College of Georgia at Augusta University. And um, I always love, love working with her, so that was another benefit as well. Oh, that's nice. And you know what? That's one of my biggest pet peeves. I, I cannot stand when parents say, oh, you know, give them now. They're young. They'll work it off or they'll burn it off or whatever. And they give them all these terrible foods to eat. And they just figure that it won't hurt them since they're young and they can afford it. But that really doesn't work that way. No, not at all. So you're, you're absolutely right. Your, your foundation is built for your, your body and your health when you're growing up. And so I think it's, it's our responsibility, whether, you know, whether there are children or not, to be very careful with the children that we have around us. So I just thought this was a great opportunity. We, we had already obtained very detailed measures of these children's health. Um, we had blood samples that were already available. We had very detailed measures of their body composition, meaning fat, muscle, and bone, and also of diabetes risk. And Dr. Tinchin mentioned uh, metabolic syndrome, which is a, a cluster of risk factors that lead you to have higher risk for heart disease and diabetes. Yeah. So we, we, it, we, it gave us the opportunity to look at these things in detail. Yeah, it's, a, it's, like, it's like you said. I mean, I learned one thing over the years. People say, well, this is a great time to start exercising. I think all entire, our entire lifetime is a great time to start exercising, whether you're 5 years old, 6 years old, or 85 years old. I'm not really sure there's a better time than not. Um, so, doctors, what did you find in your study? I'd like Dr. Well, Tinton to talk first, I guess. Well, yeah, I, I would like for um, Dr. Davis to start and talk okay. about what we found about in terms of the um, how the smoke impacted their fatness. And I'd like her to talk about cognition. And then I'll talk a little bit more about the smoke, if that's okay. Absolutely. Okay. Let's do it. So, in, in essence, we looked at several different measures of the, the children's weight status and adiposity. Adiposity being a technical term for fatness. And we found that across several different measures, whether it's um, waist size, 
or their BMI percentile or the actual um, quantification of the amount of fat in their body that the children who were exposed to smoke, which was a, a large proportion of the children, um, they were higher on that measure. Now, that doesn't mean that it was necessarily the smoke that caused it, but it's consistent with that. And as you know, we cannot randomize people to be exposed to something we know is poisonous. That's so this true. is pretty strong evidence as far as we can go in, in, in people. Now, we did not find a relationship with the diabetes risk measures that others have found in a, an older group of children. And so that may just not be the case at this age, or it may be a, a, a different group of children. Our, our kids were predominantly um, African American. Okay. Now, where the cognitive results are concerned, um, this I think was the most exciting piece because it was a very consistent finding. Every cognitive measure that we had was consistently lower in the children who were exposed to secondhand smoke. So oh, this wow. suggests that 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 smoke smoke exposure um, in the home or elsewhere, because you know you can't when we measure their blood, we can't say where the smoke was. Um, but that being exposed to smoke seems to potentially impede their progress in school. Any particular discipline? Was it math, uh, memory, uh, uh, essay writing, anything at all that specific or no? The, the measures we, we use of cognition were not quite uh, lined up that way. We did not find any relationships with their school achievement per se, but we did find um, that their cognitive abilities to plan um, detect things selectively, you know, you're looking for the, the little P and not the capital P, um, were sharper in the kids that were not exposed. Um, and this seemed to apply to things like memory for sequences, um, such as with spelling or if you need to repeat a list of numbers, that's, that's a kind of memory. Um, and also for simultaneous processing or gestalt processing. Oh, fascinating. So it sounds like it, it obviously hits some of the memory centers, the hippocampus. It, did it also affect the prefrontal cortex, you think, in your opinion? Yes, absolutely. As a matter of fact, the cognitive uh, measure that we use, we select it specifically because it is sensitive to executive function. Um, many of the typical IQ tests that are used are so structured that people with frontal lobe damage actually do very well but they won't know enough to get their own breakfast if somebody doesn't put it in front of them. Oh, so wow. this test was actually designed to tap some of that executive function by presenting um, less structured and, and somewhat more novel tasks. Fascinating. And what did you discover, Dr. Tingen? Well, I think the thing for me that was the most incredible was um, that we did have some parents that did under-report that they did not expose their kids, and indeed they did. And so for the research world, this again is another important reminder that we, when we do studies on passive smoke exposure, it could be called secondhand smoke exposure or environmental tobacco smoke exposure, we really need to do what's called biochemical verification because parents and children as well and teens typically tell us what we would hope to hear that they would not be smoking, that they would not, that they have quit, or they not, don't do it in front of their child, etc. So, once again, the literature is filled with research study after study that shows what people have reported that they are not going to take up smoking or that they quit smoking, but there's no biochemical validation of it. So, one for me, I was really glad to know that indeed it's unfortunate, but once again, we cannot go solely on self-report of what people say. They unfortunately are not always straightforward and outright with being the truth. Second of all, I was deeply saddened to see, but not surprised at the effects on cognition. And third of all, one measure Dr. Davis talked about, we have very precise measures related to their body weight and their fat composition, is we use DEXA scan. Much like most people know of a DEXA scan, that they go get it for bone densometry to see how their um, bone mass is, especially in older women that are losing um, estrogen and things like that in their bone and calcium. So we had DEXA measures on these kids, and we saw that these kids had more fatness on a DEXA measure, which is a very precise measure 
um, putting a strap around the waist and they do measuring waist circumference is, yes, outstanding. But to have a DEXA measure on a kid and say, and look, every child in this study was already either overweight or obese. But when you took that whole group and compared them to and divided them into the groups that were exposed versus not exposed, the ones that were exposed were even more um, overweight or more fat. That is pretty incredible. So, um, it is incredible. It is for me just another reminder of how much work we have to do in science to get parents to really consider being fantastic role models. Because, you know, children, 99.99% of them, regardless of how they are treated, look up to their parents. And so I believe parents are such an influential factor in children's lives. And so if a child has a parent that's a smoker, if the parent stops smoking before the child reaches fifth grade, it decreases by 50% the chance that the child will take up smoking and has such a profound effect on them. But if the parent continues to smoke throughout the child's life and on into their age, it is more than likely about 80% of those kids are going to take up smoking before they get out of high school. 80%? yeah, 80 to wow. 90 percent of all smokers start before they graduate from high school. And there is a whole field of research on the adolescent brain, and it is so much more addictive to the substance in cigarettes and cigars and hookah pipes called nicotine at an adolescent age than it is for people that start smoking when they're 35 or 40 or things like that. So huh. the... Um, the people that, you know, are the real gurus at marketing and all that and getting these early smokers in their grip, so to say, before they graduate from high school, they know exactly what they're doing because those very kids will be the ones that have the greatest difficulty in stopping smoking. A study was done many years ago. I want to say it's 15 or 20 years ago. And they interviewed people in the ninth grade that had taken up smoking, and they asked them did they think they could quit before they graduated. And in that particular study, about 90% of those kids said, I could quit any time I wanted to. You know, I could say, huh. I do it because I, all my friends do it. It's no big deal, but I, I enjoy it. And, um, and so they went back to test those same kids again in senior high. And you know what they said? Hmm. They said, we thought we could quit, but we can't. I mean, we, 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 just oh, have geez. I mean, we have to have our cigarette. Well, it's called addiction. I mean, it's a true physiological addiction, and it's a true psychological addiction. So um, anyway, parents, I call it parent power, whatever you want to have it, and I mean power in a very positive way. If parents have a fantastic, good relationship with their young children from birth on, do you know when children reach fifth and sixth grade, when peers start becoming very important to them, if there is a very positive family relationship, then children are going to pick peers that their parents more than likely like and have the same values. If they do not have a positive relationship with their parents, they are going to choose peers that they know without a doubt their parents will not be at all satisfied with them picking, you know, rebellious, so to say. So parents, to me, have a golden opportunity to really impact children for taking up tobacco use, for what they eat, and their, you know, their dietary habits, etc. And our world has become so technologically savvy and so busy, and everybody is on the go. I mean, think of how many times you go out to a restaurant and watch people, and while they're eating, how, you know, you'll see a family of four or a family of three or two or however what the family is composed of, and how many people are actually engaging in conversation anymore? Everybody yeah. has their iPad. Absolutely. So, I just think the skill of communicating and so much of values and health behaviors is really learned by modeling and by talking about it. Why is it important to choose a lean piece of meat versus a fried piece of meat? You don't figure that out by being on your iPhone. <laughs> That's a great I point. I agree with that, Dr. Tingen. And I, I want to put in a word, uh, just, uh, just a word in defense of the self-report measure. I, I totally agree it's important to get an, an objective biological measure when possible. But 
it may be that the parents felt that they answered honestly saying there was not a smoker in the household when in fact it might have been their dad's best friend who was over every night smoking that's true or it might have been their little you know their big brother who was smoking on the sly the parents may not have actually have been aware right that's true absolutely and it could be where the kids spent the rest, most of their day once they got out of school and they didn't go home at absolutely Doctors, we're going to have to wrap up shop. We're, we're running out of time. Fascinating conversation, though. Fascinating stuff. Thank you so much for your research, Dr. Martha Tingen and Dr. Katherine Davis. Thank you very much, doctors. Thank you for having us very much. Greatly enjoyed being on the show. We love it, too. It's great. Thank you very much for the insight. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Secondhand smoke and exposure with children. Parents take more responsibility is the main theme out of this talk. Very important stuff.